for cooking bacon, which he's obviously done, though he hasn't shared it with the rest of us. But I'd just like to thank Jono for making today's session happen. He, Amen. Uh, was enthusiastic Amen. that we should go ahead with it and pressed on and did what, did whatever needed doing. So uh, thanks very much, Jono, for that. And he will also um, manage the um, uh, logistics of the core today. Clearly, it's, it's not quite the same as uh, meeting on a Saturday morning, eating bacon and enjoying fellowship together. But it's, it's a good substitute and uh, we should be grateful for the technology we have at our disposal. Uh, we're continuing our series of looking at um, the, the Brothers in Christ program that has been published before. We've gone through various things as far as the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ. And now we're in doctrines around the application of redemption. And you might remember the last two sessions, well, last session plus one we had as a church, uh, Ben Midgley led us in uh, about common grace and election. And this morning, David Hughes is going to be, be uh, sharing with us and the gospel call and regeneration. I've seen his notes and it's a great topic. So thanks very much for preparing that, David. You're welcome. Uh, if anybody does want David's notes afterwards, I'm sure he's fine if we circulate them around so we can mm -hmm. do that. I didn't want to circulate it in advance in case you decide not to bother coming to the call when you've read the notes. So. <laughs> Very grateful for David for that. So we'll start with, uh, David will do his talk. We'll have a time for questions and answers as usual. And if you want to stick around, depending how many people are staying, Jono might split us up into groups or he might keep us together for a bit of a chat afterwards. So uh, shall we just have a word of prayer and then over to you, David. Lord our God, we thank you for these great topics that we've considered in our Saturday mornings over the last 18 months or so. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the fact that you are fully God. We thank you for the fact that in Jesus Christ, you became, uh, you became man, fully God and fully man on earth. We thank you for the good news of the gospel, that Christ has died for our sins and has been raised again. Uh, this morning, we pray for the session we have we have here we pray that we might have clarity on this gospel this good news i pray that you would uh, bless david as he shares with us that you'd speak to our hearts and we do pray that the technology wouldn't get in the way the hindrance to the message but we'd be able to focus on what you would say to us this morning we thank you for your every blessing and we thank you for this time together in jesus name amen amen over to you david <laughs> Well, we're into a series of topics which are about the way that God brings salvation into each of our lives. There's a, a sequence. The old uh, theologians used to call it ordo salutis, the order of salvation. Uh, a sequence which began before time itself began with election and predestination. And we've been looking at that recently. But then how does God bring to himself those he has chosen, those he's elected? And the answer is through the gospel call. So our starting point this morning is in the eighth chapter of the epistle to the Romans, if you'd like to turn it up. And verses 29 and 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now note that here is a chain of events. There is a definite order to them and the chain is unbreakable at every single point. So it begins in eternity past with foreknowledge and election and predestination and it ends in eternity future with our glorification at the end of verse 30. 
the chain is unbreakable. And we're looking at two topics that are, are part of this sequence. And the topics we're dealing with today are calling and linked to it, regeneration or the new birth. And in this way, we're covering two chapters of, of Graydon Grudem's uh, systematic theology. So let's look first of all at the gospel call and effective calling. Apparently, um, hens make a variety of different sounds. I didn't know this till I checked it out, but a mother hen can make over 20 different sounds. And there are two of them that I want to highlight. There is, first of all, a loud alarm call, which is meant for every chicken on the farmyard. And there is a softer sound that the hen uses to gather her chicks to herself. And similarly, we need to distinguish between God's general call and his special call, or as we're calling it today, his effective call. Sometimes in old book, books on theology, it will be called the effectual call. So the general call of the gospel goes out to all people. Every time the gospel is preached, that general call goes out. And there will be some people who listen to it and who will reject it. And uh, we find no end of examples of this general call in the scriptures. For instance, Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or Isaiah 55 invites us to come. Um, everyone that's thirsty, come, buy, eat, drink, take. And that's the general call of the gospel. It goes out to everybody without distinction. And that occurs, of course, every time we preach the gospel. Every time we share the gospel one to one with others, the general call is going out. But there's also the effective call that God uses to bring his elect to himself. And in some cases, when the gospel is preached, the call comes to someone so powerfully by the Holy Spirit that they come to Christ and receive the offer of the gospel. So let's think about that for a moment or two, the effective call of the gospel. And here's Grudem's definition of it. It is an act of God, the Father, speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in faith. So you can see that there is an outward call and an inward call when the gospel is being preached. The one is external to everybody, the other is internal. It is for those on whom God has set his love, who is, he has foreknown in love from before the foundation of the world whom he predestined, them he also called. So that's um, a definition that we could delve into for a moment or two. Let's pick out some of the terms in it. First of all, it begins by saying that it, the effective call is an act of God. And that's the most important thing to get clear right at the beginning that it is entirely of God. It is something that he takes the initiative in. And he is entirely the one who is active in the process of calling. So Romans 8.30 says, he also called. It's entirely of God. It, it is God who affects it. And then the second element in the definition is this. Um, and let me go back a little bit first. This act of God being entirely of God comes out in several scriptures that we should make a note of before we move on. 
you get, for instance, a verse like 1 Peter 2 verse 9, that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Or 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, God calls people into the fellowship of his son. And then again, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he calls us to his kingdom and glory. So this effective call is not a human call, but a divine one. It is a kind of summons from the king. And it is so powerful that it guarantees a response. It produces inevitably a response in the heart of those who hear it. <clears throat> and so Romans 8 goes on to say that everyone who receives this call becomes justified. That's the next, next link in the chain. So the effective call is so called because it is always, always, always productive. And if you turn up just for a few moments, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, give you a moment to find it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're, we're looking at verses 4 to 6, <clears throat> and Paul says to his readers, <clears throat> knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, how would Paul be able to be sure that these people were the elect of God? Well, he says, for our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much assurance. And he recalls that when he was at Thessalonica, there was such a special sense of God's presence as he preached, as he shared the gospel, that he was sure right there and then that these people were the elect of God as they responded to the call of the gospel. Uh, that's probably a very special situation. But it does tell us that there are occasions when God <clears throat> so witnesses with the gospel as it's being preached by some preacher somewhere, some witness to salvation, that he pours out his Holy Spirit upon people and they come to a knowledge of the Savior. That's a wonderful example of the effectual call of the gospel. Now, what are the elements of that gospel call? Hmm. Well, in evangelism, there are three vital elements that must be present. First of all, <clears throat> there must be an explanation of the facts regarding salvation. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, says Paul in Romans 10. So people must have, first of all, a basic understanding of who Jesus is and why he came. Uh, it's summarized in that great verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And these are the facts that people need to know, that Jesus has come. They need to know who Jesus is and why he came and what they need to do about it. And these are the facts regarding salvation. The second element in the gospel call is this. There is an invitation to respond. <clears throat> it's not just giving people information about the gospel, but there must be also with it an invitation to respond. You may know that the commonest word in the New Test in the Greek New Testament for preaching is the word kerygma. And 
literally kerygma means to herald the gospel or to announce a message and require a response. It's like an ambassador taking a message to a foreign country and his job is to deliver the message as he's been given it, but also to require a response to it. That's a foundational element in the gospel call. I think many preachers forget that. But we have to require people to make a decision about what we have been declaring. We offer them the, the salvation that is in Christ and they have to respond to it. Indeed, the gospel includes a command to repent and to believe. And when Jesus sends his apostles out, he tells them to preach repentance and on the basis of repentance, remission of sins. So we're to require people to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and require them to do so. And that leads to the third element of the gospel call. There's the giving of the facts, there's the invitation to respond, and thirdly, there is a promise of forgiveness and eternal life to everyone who repents and believes. There's a, a guarantee that if we trust in Christ, we shall be saved. If you repent, says uh, Peter, your sins will be blotted out. Now, <clears throat> before we leave the subject of calling, I want you to notice something that's been a great help to me um, in trying to juggle these things. How can God offer the gospel to everybody and yet only some be destined to repent, to repent and believe and actually receive the gospel. Well, I'd like you to turn for a moment now to Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 30. We're not going to read the whole passage, but I'll refer to it. Matthew chapter 11 and the second half of the chapter. And the passage begins at verse 20 with Jesus talking about human responsibility. He upbraids the uh, cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida because they didn't repent even though they saw his many miracles. And that's a very clear reminder that people are responsible before God for every opportunity they have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, than for you, because you've not taken up your opportunity. But then you notice at verse 25, without batting an eyelid, Jesus turns from the responsibility of man to the election of God. In verse 25, he says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to ch little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. And he goes on to say that no one knows the Son except the Father, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So without batting an eyelid, Jesus turns from the subject of human responsibility to divine election. And he tells us that God elects and God brings us to himself. And God it is who reveals the Lord Jesus to us. And then notice at verse 28 through to verse 30, we've got the free offer of the gospel. So once again, without batting an eyelid, Jesus turns from thanking his God, his Father in heaven for election to talking about the free offer of the gospel. He turns to everybody and says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Now it seems to me that that's a very clear and 
reminder that to Jesus, there was no contradiction in these three things, human responsibility, divine election, and the free offer of the gospel. But when we preach the gospel freely and address the gospel to whomsoever, nevertheless, the end result is down to God and the effectual call of the gospel. So I think at that point we can turn to our second topic this morning and deal with it again rather briefly, but the topic of regeneration. Because it's linked with it, isn't it? It's clear that when God calls us effectually by the gospel, something is taking place in the hearts of his elect. And the classic passage on this subject of the new birth, as you know, is the third chapter of John's gospel. You must be born again. You may know the story of George Whitfield, the 18th century evangelist who crossed the Atlantic 13 times preaching the gospel. And uh, his favorite text, his favorite sermon was the one on John 3, verse 3. You must be born again. And someone asked him, George, why is it you are always preaching on that verse? You must be born again. And he replied after a moment's thought, and he said, because you must be born again. And John 3 teaches us the logical necessity of the new birth. And why is it necessary for people to be born again? So radical a change in the heart of man. Well, we have been seeing it in our past studies of, of these topics from Grudem that the necessity lies in the total depravity of man. Man is so crippled by the fall that he cannot, without an effectual work of God in his heart, respond to the gospel. So here is Grudem's de definition of regeneration. It is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. That's a succinct and very helpful definition. And the elements in it are worth looking at in some detail. A secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. First, it is totally an act of God, like effectual calling. It is God who is the one who is the prime mover and the sole agent in the new birth. So if you're in John's gospel, please turn back to John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the Bible refers to the regeneration as being born of God, which is a continual reminder to us that it is God's work in the heart of man that produces this. It specifies that the children of God are those who are born of God, and it says that the human will doesn't bring about this kind of birth. They're not born by the will of man. And there are many other verses that would back that up. James 1, 17 and 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. John 3, verses 3 to 8, which we'll read just now, shall we? John 3, verses 3 to 8. Truly, truly, Jesus answered, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's total depravity. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. We didn't choose to be born naturally of our human parents. It is something that happened to us. And that analogy carries over into the spiritual realm. So when Paul reminds the Ephesians of their, their new birth, he says, you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It's God who quickens. A dead man cannot resurrect himself. And so it's patent that the new birth has to be produced by God. And referring back to that passage in Ephesians 2, it reminds us in Ephesians 2 verse 5, that once more that it is God who has raised us up together with Christ from the dead. And when we turn back to the Old Testament, to Ezekiel 36, it's worth turning up. Ezekiel 36 is where the new birth is predicted in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. God, God is speaking and he says, I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It's a work of God. That's the first thing that is underlined in the definition. And then we can enlarge on that for a moment and say it is particularly of the work of God, the Holy Spirit. So we read in John 3 that we are born of the Spirit. And Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Again, turn to it. It's a, one of these crucial texts on the subject of the new birth. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Here it is, by the washing of regeneration. That's a reference back to Ezekiel where God predicts, I will wash your hearts, I'll cleanse you, I'll wash you with pure water. The washing of regeneration and renewal, and both of those things, the washing and the renewal, other work of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's another passage of scripture where the, there's a chain, an unbreakable chain. That's the result of God's action. So, it's new birth is the work of God. It's the work particularly of God, the Holy Spirit. And it's particularly when the Holy Spirit uses the word of God. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. 1, chap 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Since you have been born again, 
not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. It's as if the word of God is the thing that the Holy Spirit uses. It is seminal in our personal experience when God, the Holy Spirit, brings the word of God powerfully to us and we're changed on the inside. It is an act of God. Secondly, it is a secret act. Do you remember the conversation back in John 3 when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus? And Nicodemus, theologian though he is, is completely baffled and out of his depth on this subject. And Jesus clarifies it with an illustration for him. John chapter 3, verse 8. He talks about the wind. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, that's Jesus' illustration of how it happens. It's, it's secret. You don't see it on the outside. You don't understand it. You can't explain it. It's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind as it rustles the trees. You can't see the Holy Spirit producing this change in the heart of someone, but you will see the effects of that change. You will see that the Holy Spirit has been at work. It is a secret, mysterious effect. Now, Jesus, I think, implies here that it is an instantaneous work of the Holy Spirit. And some of us... Um, find it hard to get our minds around that sometimes, especially those of us who were brought up in a Christian family and we were immersed in the word of God, in the things of God from our infancy. And some of us might find it difficult to pinpoint a point in our experience when this happened to us. But, you know, it's like the subject, like the, uh, the process of, new, of natural birth. Uh, in pregnancy, there are nine months of gestation that lead to that moment of new birth, of birth. And when we cry as a baby and life is born and that moment is noted down uh, as the moment of our independent existence. And in the same way, when someone comes under conviction of sin, there may be several months of gestation as the Holy Spirit is at work, but he brings them inevitably to a point where this great change, the new birth, happens. And God knows, God perhaps alone knows, just when that moment was in our experience. There is an instant when we pass from death to life, just as there is a moment when the newborn baby cries, and you know that they're safely born. It is a secret act, a mysterious act, although you can see the effects of it. And then the third element of Grudem's definition I want to point out is this. It imparts spiritual life. The new birth, therefore, comes logically before repentance and faith or conversion. You know, conversion is a shorthand for repentance plus faith. And in the moment when we turn from our old life and turn to Christ in faith, then something takes place which changes us. And spiritual life is imparted. Of course, from a human standpoint, all of this is happening at the same time. God is working on the inside. And then as a result, we are repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus. Acts, uh, it seems to act, uh, to take place all at once. But if we turn back to John chapter 1, 
we looked at it a little earlier, we'll see that logically speaking, new birth comes before repentance and faith. John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But how did they believe? How did they come to receive Christ and so become children of God? Verse 13 explains, who were born, once you don't know, notice the past tense, in the moment that they receive Jesus, when they trust in him, already they have been born, who were born of God. So logically speaking, it is new birth that God produces, which alone can make us believers and repent us. Now, you and I enter the kingdom of God when we become Christians of conversion. But Jesus says here that we have to be born of the spirit before we can do that. And we're unable to come to Christ until that takes place in us. Here's another helpful couple of verses later in John's Gospel. John chapter 6 and verse 44. John 6 verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day and that's effectual calling isn't it and that has to come before conversion come before in a sense of logic and order though we're talking about the things that happen in an instant at the same time really but they're cause and effect and then verse 65 in that chapter in John 6. John 6 verse 65. And Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can, can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And that's illustrated in the conversion of Lydia. As we saw in one of our other studies, uh, Acts 16, 14, it says that the Lord opened her heart in order that she would give attendance to the things that Paul was saying. So first of all, the Lord opened her heart and then she was able to give heed and to respond in faith to what Paul was preaching. There's the order again. It imparts spiritual life. And then finally, genuine new birth always brings results in someone's life. The fourth element in Grudem's definition is this one, that inevitably it will alter someone's life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, see, everything becomes new. And that is why we have one book in the New Testament devoted to this subject. It's the first epistle of John. And you'll recall that it gives us several tests of how we know someone is a real Christian. And those tests are laid out. There are four or five of them in John's Gospel. Um, we won't bother to look up the verses, but here they are, if you're making a note of them. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, chapter 3, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 7, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. If someone is born of God, they will be holy, they will be obedient to God's commands, they will not sin continually in their lives, they cannot go on sinning. These are the tests that John 
brings before us and others besides. So if someone says they're a Christian, but their lives have never been altered, they are not true Christians. If someone claims to be born again, but they are not living a godly life, over some period of time, if they are chronically in a state of sin, then their profession is false. Genuine new birth always brings results in someone's life. Now, that's me done. I'll leave, the, the, leave it at that and I'll hand back to Jonathan and he can take us into discussion.